So uh, Terry made a very profound statement in there. Um, read this many years ago, and as we were planning our World War II exhibit, I said, let's bring Terry Kay in and talk about how World War II changed Georgia a bit, and then also the conversation about race, which has opened very profoundly in the country in the last year. Um, very profound words from Terry there in the runway. Um, Ingram Library is Penelope Melton Society, our friends group. We're very pleased um, to have all of you members today. If our members would raise your hands. Uh, if you're interested in membership, contact one of these folks. And I'd like to call on Dr. John Curley, the president, to speak. Thank you, Lorraine, and thank you for coming uh, today. The Nelson Society uh, is committed to libraries. We try to make the library the hub of the campus and try to impress on students here at West Georgia the importance of the library, not only while they're a student here, but hopefully through, throughout their lives, uh, libraries will be part of their, their lives. And uh, we also try to bridge the gap between academia and the general public uh, and try to accomplish both by uh, hosting exhibits. We had exhibits on Abraham Lincoln and, as Lorraine mentioned, on World War II in Georgia uh, this past year. Uh, we also try to have uh, uh, talks by faculty members. And in a month, on March the 3rd, Christine Simmons Moore in psychology, who's done a great deal of work on sleep and the paranormal, is going to talk right here at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I uh, heard the intriguing title of her talk is When Things Go Bump in the Night and Day. And she's going to talk about sleep. And then uh, in early April, Ben Steer in anthropology will talk on Native Americans who lived in this area, the Cherokees and the Creeks who lived in this area uh, long ago. So, and then next fall, we're having another exhibit, and it's an exhibit of uh, photographs taken by a New York Times, the New York Times White House photographer from 1945 to 1985, George Taines, There'll be more than 30 photographs in that exhibit covering the presidencies of Franklin Roosevelt through Ronald Reagan, books of display cabinets and whatever, and we hope that uh, you'll see information on that as we get closer uh, to the fall. I hope you'll <coughs> consider becoming a part of the uh, Melson Society and helping us with these uh, exhibits and talks. And on the back of the program, uh, you'll find a little a mention of uh, how you can pay. If you want to pay today, Julie Dobbs, will you raise your hand? There's Julie. She's secretary treasurer of the Nelson Society, and she can take uh, your, your check. Thank you very much. We turn it back to the Pleasure to welcome back uh, West Georgia College 1957 graduate, most likely to succeed, Terry Kay. Uh, here, and I also want to welcome his lovely wife Tommy, also class of 1957, and here they are together on the sweetheart board. <laughs> and the champions, so Tommy, if you would stand. <coughs> We have some other partners in crime from the class of 1957. Lee and Jackie Walburn, if you would stand, or over here with Tommy. We have some exhibits over by the front door from the Chieftain, so you can see further what they were up to while we were here at West Georgia College. I think Terry said there were about 400, 500 students back in the day uh, when we were a two-year college. Uh, but to formally introduce Terry, I'm very pleased to call on my colleague, Dean Randy Hendricks, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities, who'll do the formal introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine, and uh, thank you, John, and the other members of the Society for bringing this program to us this afternoon. I was talking to Terry just a few minutes ago about the last time he and I spoke, and he realized that's what he's doing. He's on. I didn't need these. <laughs> it's my pleasure today to introduce Terry Kate, a prolific author of a number of genres, including interviews, journalism, tell plays, essays. But he's best known, of course, as an 
novels. I think there are over 14 books of fiction published under his name. Yeah. He won international acclaim for his 1990s novel, Dance with the White Dog, which brought him the Southeastern Library Association's Outstanding Author of the Year Award and was adapted in 1993 as an Emmy Award winning Hallmark Hall of Fame production starring the legendary Hume Cronin and Jessica Tangi. Terry was inducted into the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame in 2006 and has been named Georgia Author of the Year four times in the Georgia Writers Association. There are a number of elements in Terry's work I'd like to talk about, but of course you came to hear him this afternoon. I will say how struck I am by the handling of memory in his fiction. Memory as a subject, almost at times the medium rather than the language that renders it. The weight of memory, it's almost palpable uh, presence uh, as a major definer of some of his more memorable characters. That's what it seems to me. That may be a southern thing, but Terry is anything but a writer dealing in southern cliches. We just want to talk about some southern history, fiction, at least in part today. And with Robert Penn Warren, he seems to understand that there are two kinds of memory. One narrative and the other symbolic. So without a strict difference between the two at all times. And while I'm on the subject of memory, I want to say that what I'm about to relate from my own, I hope, is mostly accurate. <laughs> at least symbolic. In 2004, Terry won the Townsend Award for Fiction and was recognized as George Author of the Year one of his four times for his novel, The Valley of Life, which was also a later adapted to the screen. <coughs> Coincidentally, another writer with West Georgia Connections was also nominated for the Towns and the Guard the same year. But you know from what I just said, I didn't win the lot. <laughs> <coughs> I was long a member of the award ceremony for the Towns. A lunch affair in Baldwin of an Atlanta hotel the 12 nominees had reserved tables, and I was excited to see Terry's table next to mine. But we also saw that my table had been completely taken over by a large group of fashionably dressed women who I assumed formed some sort of reading group. They obviously had not noticed the table was reserved, and must have thought I was an idiot as I stood over them feeling like the Rodney Dangerfield of Georgia Lambert. <laughs> they did tell us. If we couldn't find a seat somewhere else to come back and make try to squeeze this in. <laughs> Terry and Tommy had seats available at their table and kindly invited us to join them and their regards. We had a fine conversation through lunch, part of which centered, and here's where I'm hoping my memory will lie, part of which centered on the fact that Terry was wearing a sweater for the occasion, but somewhere over the course of the day that picked up a noticeable stain on the front. Tommy complained mildly about his dress, but then Terry explained to all of us at the table that writers have to learn to look the part for such occasions, and he believed he had achieved it. <laughs> <laughs> we forgot the sweater when uh, the announcement was made, and Terry came to the podium and made humble, witty, and memorable remarks about the art. Both Terry and Tommy, as we mentioned, are WG alums. So help me welcome back the Georgia writer we should recognize. Uh, 
but I love them all dearly. The only people on earth I've ever been afraid of were my sisters. <laughs> I have no mercy whatsoever. And every opportunity I have to talk about them, I do. And this is one of those opportunities. There is a story taken out of my childhood about a little church that we attended in the little community of my childhood, Bound, which is below Boyston. Uh, and they had a Methodist church. Oddly, there was no Baptist church in the community. Oh, it's just a little Methodist church. And because it was tiny, very small, not many people attended, they obviously did not have a full-time minister, but they had a guy who was who did the circuit writing, and you all know what that means. Uh, he would be at one church on one Sunday, and another church on another, and a third, and another. Well, this particular minister, uh, and I think he was kind of wise in this. He realized he could not possibly know what was going on in the community and all the needs that, would, uh, that, that were present among the congregants. Uh, so he developed a habit of asking two members of the congregation to give a morning prayer every Sunday, one to begin it and one to end it. The reason, I think, is because if the first person forgot somebody that had a gallop or something, the second person might pick it up and say, and God, please, Sister Sarah, she's, uh, she's got the gal, take care of her. I think it's a lovely uh, One Sunday, he made a horrible mistake of calling on two of my sisters to deliver a morning prayer. My sisters, we we grew up there, I grew up in a remarkable family, I want you to know that. Uh, I've said many times my problem as a southern writer is I did not grow up in a dysfunctional family. <laughs> if I had, I would have been much richer than I am now. I can name some of my friends who have capitalized on that, and you would understand. Anyway, on this particular Sunday evening, my two sisters knew by the by, by the expectation of the family that they had to get up and try. And so they stood, uh, knees knocking, the mouth and dry. And the preacher said, uh, Gene, you started, Mel, you finished. And they bowed their heads. And Gene said, Did God take over Mel? <laughs> He raised the clipboard in his hand 
and slammed it down on the earth. Uh, and this is what he said. Ladies and gentlemen, you are no longer in high school. You are in college. And you will behave as though you know what you're doing. In my class, you will take notes extensively. And when I ask for them to be given back to me, you will give them back the way I gave it to you. He terrified us. He terrified us. And I will tell you that in my four years of instruction at different institutions, nobody made the impression on me as much as George Moore did. A lot of that came from a speech that I made for the, for the, for the class. It formed, in my mind as a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old, something that would later make its way into everything I've written in one form or another. I made a speech one day in that class called The Inevitability of Integration. Now, I made a mistake. I could have said the inevitability of desegregation. But it was a speech that uh, bothered some people. I was called into the office of the then president, the most remarkable, Urban S. Ingram, to talk about it. He did not say to me, Terry, you made a mistake. All he wanted to know is, are you all right? I know you've gotten some criticism of this, and I wonder if it's uh, frightened you, if you feel threatened. Are you all right? And I said, yes, Dr. Ingram, I'm fine. I chatted for a minute, and he said, I do not disagree with you at all. I think the main thing that drives this question to you is whether or not you feel threatened. As a Dr. Ingram, I believe with all my soul that within 10 years, West Georgia will be integrated or desegregated. It was eight years later. Everything that I have written since that time dealing with any kind of social question, especially in the settings of the South, have always had the echo of that meeting with Dr. Ingram about it. There was another thing that George Norman did that influenced my writing more directly than any other piece of literature. He cast me to play the role of Tom in Tennessee Williams' magnificent play, The Glass Menagerie. Of all the things that I have ever read, I've ever written about, I've ever participated in, that production of the Glass Menagerie at West Georgia College is the thing that I return to over and over and over because I think it's one of the most perfect pieces of American literature that exists. And that's why, in many ways, I was so happy when Lorene asked me about being here today and the topic of over here and there, Georgia and Georgia in World War II appealed to me a great deal. Because I think it's the most significant period in American history, and it's a period that I write about gladly. It's a period that excites me most about any kind of story that, that sort of tends to pop up in the imagination. The post-World War II period is my very favorite setting. Now, there are lots of reasons for that. Number one is because it's not cluttered. If you write contemporary stuff, you've always got to put in you know, emails and cell phones and all that stuff. But if you write about that period of time, you're writing about people, you're writing about character, and you're writing about incident. And that matters to a writer is where the setting is, how easy it is, what is offered most when you're developing a story. I said earlier in the interview, I don't, I don't write ever to tell a story. 
I'd like to discover one. And I hope that makes some sense to Dusty, because it's the only real joy I have is discovering something that I didn't know or was too dumb to see at the time. But there's a lot of personal history in this to me. As I said, I have seven sisters. My oldest sister, Lula, lost her first husband, Harry Patel, in the Second Battle of the Falls on January the 6th, 1945. I have loved talking with my other brothers-in-law over the time. They're all dead now. I had one who died recently. He was the second husband of my oldest sister. He told these wonderful stories about going into the service of the army. And he, he was, Jim was something of a mischievous person. He was always testing the war. He went in as a PFC and he told him, uh, he made a PFC and he came out as a proper PBT. He didn't, he didn't fare well in the service. I had a brother-in-law who flew, was in the Army Air Force, he crash landed in the Pacific and was on this island for several weeks until he was rescued. I loved him telling those stories and what they did. And, uh, all of it had a sense of romance and a sense of adventure that, uh, that we as little children enjoy faking and, 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 and you know, magnifying a great deal. The others, I had another brother in law service and he was an artist and he would send back bracelets that he made out of airplane parts. All of these people have an influence on me in, 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 in the determination of what that time was and what it meant. When I wrote my first book, The Year the Lights Came On, it was an important part and I want to read a little bit from that book. Uh, because this was to give you some idea that it was important to me as a writer of this topic, even back in that period of time, and I'm delighted by the fact that this has been published and has, uh, has the floor to the runaway in it, because uh, as well as I can put it, that's what I feel about that particular time, and I hope you take the chance to read it. In 1945, the war ended. The fighters stopped fighting. Now, this is written from the perspective of a 10-year-old, 11-year-old boy. The fighters stopped fighting, convinced by the finality of two puffy clouds, polluted with itchy little particles of death. Two puffy clouds billowing up and lapping their shadows over Japanese cities called Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the people caught in the umbrellas of those clouds watched, horrified and defeated, as skin and flesh and bone melted in the most peculiar pain anyone had ever known. Right or wrong, that was it, period. Argue with Loretta, condemn Truman, or praise him, it happened. It is a personal side to that first atomic day, the day of Hiroshima, but I remember that Wesley and Freeman and R.J. Wallop and I had been playing war in the big gully. It was a day of fury, of bullets splattering about us like great raindrops. But we were not afraid. We had become accustomed to imaginary death with imaginary men falling back through their lives, their voices weakened to primeval crying, and then vanishing into the remembered wounds of their mothers. But the dying even of imaginary men had given us a stern resolve. The war must be ended. Freeman suggested bombs, and we gathered an arsenal of dirt clods and bombed the smithereens every supply room and suspicious straw hut in the big gully. And then it became late in the day and we heard the yodeling call to supper. In play war, there was always sundown, always the lower boom being only a race to sprint through the woods. And we would put away our machine guns and pistols of mountain laurel and chinaberry sticks. And we would rise up from our wounds and bend those we had fought for peaceful rest. Then we would take one, two, three, go into our racial step sprint. At sundown, war was just a game. And so it was on that first atomic day when our dirt clogs 
till Hiroshima. Those who lived in Royston emerged cautiously from a bomb shelter of fear and trembling after World War II. There was a feeble effort at a street celebration, but no parades, no jubilant shouting, we won, we won, no confetti, no foaming bottles of champagne. The people of Royston looked about, took their dreadful senses, and mourned those who had been spent in death at such places as Caribido, Manila, Bataan, Iwo Jima, Belgium, far away places, places with names as foreign as a realization that a son or a husband had been murdered in what mankind regarded as a curious dignity. For a split of time, it passed so quickly in the ether. The people of Boston lingered in cemeteries with rakes and shovels and hedge flickers and tended the graves of their, of their dead, their long dead. It would be months, perhaps years, before the United States government returned the bodies of the soldiers. But there was a need to be in cemeteries, a need to become accustomed to the mood of that frustrated anguish, a need to trace in the mind's traces the exact spot for that exacting triangle. And there were the thoughts, always the thoughts. In that lingering, in that slither of time, the American rehabilitation began. Reforms and pledges and GI bills and no more collecting scrap iron boys, no more rationing water. Keep your eyes peeled, bargain hunter, because Lord oh, mercy, there's lots of bargains going up for the war social salchion block. And it was over, over, over. Too bad FDR had not seen it through. Never mind, I'll we'll never forget it. There's that four column newspaper photo of FDR at his best, a stylish tilt to his cigarette holder a sharp, affable gleam in his eye. And if you were a Democrat in America, you'd better buy shot at the thumbtack to the wall. In that beginning, that slither of time, all of this happened in the American rehabilitation. And the people of Washington did not realize it had happened. Everything was spinning too fast. The tag end of 1945, when the world was on an English drum whirling through the carnival park was called assassin and Timothy. The people of Royston, like the people in thousands of other places, were still anemic and pale from the Great Depression. And now this World War II, and all these men, these men gone to God or forever, or worms, or whatever. That was the puzzle, the bewilderment, the lamentation of ministers saying, God and sweet Jesus, and ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and blessed are those who suffer. For there was no one to answer, really answer, while these men were gone. There was only one mercy, it was over. The Great Depression, World War Number Two, it was over. A moment to rest, a moment to linger. Let the American rehabilitation go forth with all good speed, one moment longer. A slither of time to take it in. And that is what I got out of the story of my brothers in law and out of the memories of, of the newscast and out of, uh, out of the association with people who had been in the war, who had lost people, out of those, those moments of can we come back and be the same as we were before? And, and no, it couldn't. They put it all, and, that, and, and that's what has interested me most of the time. I do not believe that any event in the history of this country is as significant as World War II. Not even the Revolution or the Civil War, uh, because in World War II, it had the, the, the technology that, that uh, developed out of all the experiments of went on. It had, when they came back, the ability of these men to go to college on the GI Bill. And most of all, it had the memory of experiences they had had by meeting people from other parts of the world. The man that grew up on a 40-acre, two-mule dirt farm in the Vanna community went off to war and he met somebody from New Jersey and Montana and Vermont. He went to places in Europe and in the Pacific. And he came back 
to the echo of those languages that he heard and the memories of all the experiences that he had had. He did not come back to the mills to the 40 acre dirt farm. He came back to textile mills. He came back to promises. He came back with an awareness, though not stated at all, that his life had been changed because of what he had seen and heard. And that is when to me desegregation began in World War II, not in the 50s, but the fourth battle of the year, and all the protests and everything else. It came to me in, 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 in a very powerful way when on the farm where we lived, a car drove up one day and it had a New Jersey tag on it. I remember this because I've never seen a car with a New Jersey tag. I don't think I've ever seen a car with any tag except Georgia. Uh, but he came up and he wanted to know where one of my brothers was going. My be. He was driving to Florida, coming out of New Jersey, going to Florida. And he wanted to spend some time with his old friend from the, from the days in the army. His name was Dombosky. And for somebody who grew up in Valley, Georgia, to hear a name like Dombosky was an incredible shock. <laughs> Years later, when I was casting about to write something that I thought would have some meaning, I didn't know what it was going to be, but I thought I would, I would like to do something that, that makes me study, that, that involves my thinking. Not about me, but something about the experiences I have had of observing people, watching people, and listening to people. So I sat down to write a book. I wrote it. It took me years to write it. The name of that book was The Prayer of Dreamers. It was based on the magnificent dream speech of Martin Luther King Jr which I have always considered to be a prayer and not a political statement. So I called it a prayer of dreams. I wanted to write about a young black boy and a young white boy born in the same community on the same day in the same minute who grew up to be great friends. I wanted to go 50 years in their lives from the period of that birth in segregation through that period of desegregation until finally, 50 years later, they come back together. And they discover, what do they discover when they come back together? That was the interesting thing to me. What is it they're going to discover? It was, I, I think, the, the one book that I wish had been published, but uh, the publishers in New York didn't particularly care. And they found this out. They did not like a white Southern writer of my age writing about this issue of race. Because surely I would be influenced by that horrible history that I had of segregation. I had, would have no ability to have any insight into what all of this meant. Something foolish thought. But they did take the first part, and that became the runaway, which you got. The, the, the second part they sort of ignored. And then I came back later with the third part, which they didn't even know was the third part, because I changed it a great deal. And that was in the Book of Marie, which is the one single book that I have that I think is important. I'm so glad people enjoy White Dog. I have a great time. I would never have been the white dog had it not been for that crazy man that stood up a few minutes ago. In fact, I wouldn't be a writer had it not been for him. He put me to writing at West Georgia College when he was the editor of the West Georgia, whatever it was. Georgia? The West Georgia? Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> he put me to writing for that and I we became friends. And I, I got to tell you, <laughs> I followed him. Years and years and years in uh, his writing career. Oh my God, was it that is magnificent? 
He was for many, many years, the longest serving editor of Atlanta Magazine, and the only quarrel I've ever had with my friend Lee Walker is that he won't write prose, he won't write fiction. But he does have a book, by the way, that is of his collection of columns that is absolutely brilliant. Anyway, uh, I think I would not have written quite a book had it not been for him. Because I wrote a story about the death of my father that he liked a lot. It's actually picked up by Reader's Digest. St. Louis Post magazine, several other magazines picked it up. We got a lot of good attention about it, and we were having lunch one day. We were celebrating the fact that it had, that it had been successful as a magazine piece. And I said to him rather casually, you know, Lee, actually, maybe I should have written something about the white dog. And he said, what white dog? So I told him this story about the white dog, and he looked at me and he said, expletive. Idiot, that is the story. How in the world did you miss that? What kind of fool are you? And it, I mean, he was unkind. He was very unkind. <laughs> and because he's stubborn, unbelievably stubborn, he decided I should write this story about this white dog, and I said, I'm not going to do that. Not going to do it because I don't want to. I've written about my father, and I know you can go back to do this thing. No, no, no. So we, we went round and round about this for a couple of years. And then one day he had a friend call him. This guy was dying of cancer. And uh, the late Jim Town, uh, one of the towns of the world, but you know, I had to get it. I've always been funny that we get the towns of the world with fiction when town in it had nothing to do with fiction at all. But he was a con man. He was a great, great con man. And, uh, Brilliant magazine man, there's no question about it. But uh, Lee said, uh, I need to get that story out of Terry. And Jim said, what story? He said, it's about a white dog. Jim said, well, I'll take care of it. They told me, he got an unfunded. Hey, okay, it's, it, it's Townsend. I said, how you doing, Jim? He said, I'm fine. I want that dog story on my desk at 9 o'clock on Monday morning. <laughs> and hung up. And I thought, I, if Walbert, I can turn down. I can't turn this fool down. So one afternoon, three hours, I wrote the story of the White Dog, Magazine of Fish. And this is what happens when you're writing life and you're lucky. Got a note in the letter from a friend who said, tell us a lovely story. But you made such a mistake. It's a novel. It's not a magazine. And I thought, oh my God, he's right, he's right, he's right. And I went to the typewriter, that's how long ago it was. <laughs> I went to the typewriter and I wrote the first paragraph of that book. And when I wrote it, this is one of those things where you have these epiphanies occasionally. I knew the entire book after the first paragraph. I knew your opinion after the first paragraph. I wrote it in two months. It took me several months to write a magazine piece about my father. So, all of this has changed after World War II. These are the influences of World War II on our culture, on the society, on who we are. The changes have been basically in my opinion very much for the good. Uh, because the world is different. The world is incredibly different. How many of you know the play I mentioned earlier, The Glass Menagerie? I want to leave this with you. What I got out of The Glass Menagerie and out of what Tennessee Williams saw was that all things change. And that in this particular time, the change was incredible, dramatic. From a candlelit world to a world of lightning. I was fired from writing a poem on the little shoebox. I left St. Louis. 
I descended the step of this fire escape for the last time and followed from then on in my father's footsteps, attempting to find in motion what was lost in space. I traveled around a great deal. The city swept about me like dead leaves. Leaves that are torn away, colored, brightly colored, but torn away from the branches. I would have stopped when I was pursued by something. It always came upon me unawares, taking me all together by surprise. Perhaps it was a familiar bit of music. Perhaps I am, I am walking along the street at night in some strange city before I have met companions. I passed the lighted window of a shop where, where perfume is sold. The window is filled with pieces of colored glass like pieces of a shattered rainbow. Then all at once, my sister touches my shoulder. I turn around and look into her eyes. Oh, Lord, Lord. I try to leave you behind me, but I am more faithful than I intended to be. I reach for a cigarette. I cross the street. I run into a bar or the movies of I drink. I speak to the nearest stranger. Anything that can blow out your hands. Blow out your hands, Lord. But nowadays, the world is lit by lightning. And that is what I have learned in the 60 years since I first stepped foot from the campus of Westbrook College. My wife and I talk about it all. We were remembered on the drive down here. That on a Friday afternoon, in those days, West Georgia was a suitcase stop to make people home. Maybe 20 or 30 people would stay. Every Friday afternoon, on a day like today, that was lovely, we would walk across the street to the Sunset Country Club. Is that it? Sunset Country Club. And we'd walk around the Country Club dock. And then we would come back out and we'd walk up to the square. And there was a bakery there. That's good. <laughs> there was a bakery there, and we would buy a cream puff. Is that what you call it? A cream puff. And we'd eat it. That was our that was our weekend. That was our day. I didn't have a lot of money, but I was also cheap. <laughs> I had a lot of money. So. Anyway, you cannot.